next speaker, uh, Christopher Anderton, who's going to talk about um, revealing the metabolome within plant tissue at the single cell level with spatially resolved mass spectra spectrometry and mass spectrometry imaging approaches. Um, really impressive work here. All right, take it away, Chris. Um, thank you for the introductions and uh, thanks for the organizers for inviting me. Uh, this is my favorite organization and community and I really feel honored to be able to present uh, at this second annual symposium. Um, yeah, so as noted, I'm Chris Anderton and I'm at the Environmental Molecular Science Laboratory which I'll talk about in a second, uh, but that is on the campus of Pacific Northwest National Lab in Washington State. Uh, so the major technique I'm going to talk about uh, focuses on uh, uh, spatial resolved mass spectrometry. Some of us probably know bulk mass spectrometry if you're doing proteomics or lipidomics and you uh, basically extract out your sample. You may do some other modifications to measure different types of molecules. Uh, here what we're talking about is where we probe a sample in an in situ fashion and get the uh, mass spec at each of these locations. Uh, with this, we can uh, target single cells, which I'm, I'll talk about, and we can also do uh, mass spec imaging. Um, and this, one of the benefits of this is that uh, we can I localize where molecules are or elements, depending on what type of a method we're using. And then uh, we can also um, start to see some rare um, molecules as well, because sometimes those get washed out when you look at a bulk uh, process. You might not see smaller, uh, less abundant molecules uh, in the signal uh, if you're looking at bulk stuff, but if you're doing spatially defined, very discrete measurements, you might be able to see these rare molecules. Uh, so there's a lot of different types of methods for spatial ionization uh, and MSI, and uh, we have a review. And feel free to take pictures or use the QR codes on my talk. That's why I put them in there. I know that um, I wanted to explicitly say that because that's one of the PCA policies too. So please feel free to take pictures, screenshot or what not of uh, my talk. Um, anyways, so uh, as noted, there's a multiple different methods of, of doing spatial mass spectrometry. All of them have their own benefits and limitations. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some of them here, uh, but, as I noted, I'm at the Environmental Molecular Sab uh, uh, Science Laboratory, which is a Department of Energy user facility located on the campus of PNNL. And since EMSL's mission is in part to lead molecular level discoveries for the DOE that translates to predictive understanding for national energy and environmental challenges, we have a suite of tools that can address these challenges. Um, we're one of uh, two uh, DOE BER user facilities, the other one being the JGI. We can, if you're interested in working with either of us or just uh, EMSL, I'll have a link at the end of this talk that you can um, uh, go to. Uh, but yeah, so we have a number of MSI tools within Emma, uh, within uh, EMSL, and I'm not gonna go into what all these acronyms mean. It's an alphabet soup. As I noted, they all have their own benefits and limitations and are some are really good in, for looking at um, small molecules. Others are good for looking at metals and stuff and tissue. But yeah, um, and we also have, a, as part of the capability, obviously we have a number of excellent experts. And I wanna focus a lot today on the efforts of Mike Taylor and, and Dushin. Uh, Dushin gave a talk yesterday in the second session. If you wanna go back and watch that, if you didn't get an opportunity, I'll talk, talk about one or two of, uh, of the things he talked about uh, yesterday. And then a, a new uh, postdoc working with us, Robert Stanley. Um, so, a lot of the work that we developed our mass spec imaging capabilities on were part of another DOE um, uh, imaging, uh, bioimaging grant uh, with Gary Stacy and Akush Vertiz. And uh, with these tools, we use uh, a model system, which was the soybean root nodule. So this is a specialized uh, root organ that uh, is created when they have a symbiotic uh, interaction with uh, bio, uh, rhizobia and uh, the root tissue of uh, the, the soybean, where they form these specialized nodules where we have infected uh, plant cells um, that are infected with the rhizobia. Uh, within this area, we have uh, biological nitrogen fixation occurring um, and uh, the plant supplies uh, sugars and other kinds of uh, carbon-based molecules for energy. 
uh, usually a lot of organic acids, et cetera, um, to the bacteria as well. And so it, this is a pretty good model um, uh, for looking at both plant biology, but also some um, microbiology, understanding interkingdom interaction. So we've used this a lot through our research. Um, and I'll show you the kind of the significance of that when you think about a metabolome and you have an interacting species. Um, but um, one of the first uh, implementations of this is that we showed that we could do broad molecular imaging of the soybean uh, root metabolome. So this is with a matrix assisted laser desorption ionization, MALDI MSI. If you're interested more in how that technique works, uh, Dushin goes into detail in that in his talk. So I won't spend too much time here. But one of the things we can see is that we can see molecules that localize to uh, uh, within the infection zone, deep within the infection zone in that case, uh, usually probably where there's ano more anox conditions. These soy saponins are on the epidermis of the nodule. Uh, we see stuff that's still within the plant root uh, that's attached to uh, the, the actual uninfected root tissue, that I mean. And then we see some interesting thing we saw was this asymmetry of some metabolites. Uh, it was sort of thought of as this kind of being a, sort of a homogeneous gradient, like some of these um, um, images here of either you have things kind of concentrated on the epidermis or in the center, and maybe you saw a gradient going in and out. But asymmetry wasn't something we planned on looking, uh, seeing in our data. And one of the interesting things is that we saw this reproducibly. And I'm only showing like three nodules here, but we did way more than three nodules. And we continued to see that SAM had an asymmetric distribution, especially when you looked at uh, the distribution of heme B, which we used as a, a marker of where we thought the highest concentration of biological nitrogen fixation was because uh, of it rating, regulating the uh, anoxic conditions within the nodule. Um, we know that SAM was important in biological nitrogen fixation because we infected plants with um, NIF-H rhizobia or a rhizobia that had this uh, the NIF-H gene knocked out. So it was very ineffective at uh, doing biological nitrogen fixation. So this gives you kind of an idea of the heme where we see that's still downregulated, but we also see um, that the SAM still um, is present um, but is, is less affected there, is also um, less abundant. Um, and then Dushin showed this briefly yesterday, but we can do molecular topography or uh, 3D MALDI MSI where we take a section and we section through the tissue, we mount all of those and then we image and then we use a computational method um, to rebuild uh, what our ion images look like. And um, with this, what we try to do is we try to think about what, um, what uh, metabolic pathways SAM might be utilized within the um, within the soybean root nodule, and it plays a major role as an amino propyl group, uh, group donor uh, for uh, the biosynthesis in the soybean nodule. Um, this is for uh, the plant itself as a uh, as a plant um, metabolite, and then as a methyl donor during the PC biosynthesis and the rhizobia. So it plays a role. Uh, and biosynthesis in both of these um, uh, uh, species. So that's one reason we think maybe it has this asymmetric distribution. One of the cool things we did saw when we saw when we did 3D uh, uh, molecular imaging is we also saw asymmetry in the plane that we weren't imaging because we were only looking at one image. We thought uh, the spirine uh, molecule was sort of just sort of localized all through the infection zone. But when we looked at the 3D, distribution of this, we see that it's actually much more asymmetrically distributed as well. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to bring up uh, one of the things that we've really been working on, and, and Dushin talked about this, and I, I really encourage folks to go back and watch this part if they haven't, is uh, one of the major challenges that we have with uh, uh, MALDI MSI and, and these kind of molecular imaging is that some of the smaller molecules are very hard to detect. Um, and they also are low in abundance, so like phytohormones. So we've came up with a new derivatization method that helps us uh, with the ability to detect these molecules um, and gives us a lot more confidence uh, based upon the molecular tag that we put on and their identity. So we can more accurately uh, identify the chemical formula and match that with what the molecule might be. Um, 
so uh, the, I want to move on to uh, a different technology that we didn't talk about, uh, but I think is very valuable for plants, which is laser ablation electrosplay ionization mass spectrometry. And uh, a lot of the work I'm going to show you, at least right here, is some of the great work that Sylvia Stopka did with us when she was in the Oculus Vertis lab and she came and visited us and worked in EMSL and we built this system. Um, here, uh, what we use is a 2940 nanometer laser. And if you remember any organic chemistry, um, you probably might remember IR spectroscopy. And if you look, there's a very sharp water band at 2940 nanometers. And that's uh, where the OH vibration is. So if we have a water rich sample like plants, the native plant tissue, we can just use this laser and ablate directly into that sample where we superheat the molecules, uh, the water molecules in that area, causing an explosion event where we can knock out all these molecules that are in that area. And most of those are neutral. So what we have to do is we spray an uh, electrospray right through there and intercept the molecules to ionize them. And then we can get mass spec data that way. And so this is just data straight from different tissue. Uh, so these are just cell cultures of the rhizobia, this is some root tissue we just analyzed, and this is the nodule tissue that we homogenized just to kind of show, oh, we see different spectra. And, and we, in this paper, we show what this maps back to um, and possible metabolic processes that are active in each of those tissues and samples. Um, and we built this, and EMSL has this unique 21 Tesla FTICR, our Fourier transfer and IM mass spec. Um, we built this source for that. And the only reason, the only thing I want to show and highlight here is when you use FTICR mass spectrometry, you're able to resolve the isotopic fine structure of molecules. So if you look at, you have your monoisotopic peak of what your chemical formula is and, and, and heme B here, let's say, but you will also have uh, minor distributions uh, of, of, your, of these isotopes. And you can confirm what those isotopes are and get an idea of what your molecular formula is. So this gives you really high confidence molecular formula data. Um, and then we use the molecular formula data to match back to a database. So our, our, our data is only good as the databases and how well we've understood what molecules might be present. Just that's one caveat I always wanna point out. Um, so this is still work with uh, Sylvia and uh, then Leith was able to work with us as well. Both were grad students at, um, in Akush's group at the time. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to move this work into a doing single cell metabolomics. So the first thing we did was we used a fiber-based uh, coupling system where we uh, coupled our fiber into the, uh, our laser into the fiber and we etched the tip and we could go and basically point at the cell we wanted and just ablate what uh, cell we were looking at. So this is kind of an idea. You can see here's a targeted cell. These are the soybean root nodules. So this is an infected cell. We're using a GFP, um, uh, basically optical train here where we can see where our cells are and then we can ablate it. And then again, we can get a single cell. Uh, I, um, I stopped fine structure with this fiber lacy based system. That system is very powerful, but it's very slow because you have to go from cell to cell to cell to cell, right? So we, we my team um, moved on from this and thought about, could we do something a little bit different where we created a molecular microscope? So in, in line with our, um, our, our um, laser train here, where, our optical train where we can ablate the sample, we also can also uh, put a camera and use this long distance reflective objective. So not only can we uh, visualize the sample and get microscopy data, but we can also do uh, target where we want to hit with the laser. Because once the sample is in focus on the, on the camera, we know that the laser is in focus as well. So this is kind of what the actual instrument looks like. Uh, this is in its current state, uh, but the data I'm going to show you, we only had uh, one, opto uh, one uh, bright field microscope on. Um, so we could at least visualize what the cell sort of structure looked like, et cetera, and then target there. Um, and so this is kind of what we were doing where we would say, okay, this is, we could, once we focus the laser, this is actually a lot of power. We can use, get it down to 30 microns, at least with this optic, we can change optics and we might have to change some other things just to make uh, the, the distances work out in the instrument configuration, but we can do a, um, an image of the sample 
and then we can target individual cells here. Uh, and one of the things we were able to do, um, and this is just some IM mobility data, I'm not gonna go into how that works, but it's another orthogonal method uh, where we measure the actual size of a molecule before we measure its mass, is we can measure uh, multiple molecules from single cells um, at a time and have high confidence in their molecular annotations. Um, ooh, I did, um, sorry, I misordered these slides. One of the things I wanted to show you uh, was that we could also, once not only could we do this um, individual microscope image, but we could do microscope image stitching and autofocus if our sample had topography. Um, so that helps us keep uh, the laser in focus as well. And then through cell segmentation and automated cell identification, just through some machine learning plugins on uh, ImageJ, we're able to then identify in an automated fashion where um, cell centers might be. So we can do this uh, image uh, uh, cell by cell and move a lot quicker. So now we're in a place where we can do high throughput screening. And so this is just onion cells, they're fairly large. And, but we can see the metabolic variants across um, these different cells within the same tissue uh, by measuring by cell, by cell, by cell. And um, we have some idea uh, based upon what the technical noise of our sample, of our instrument and our instrumental setup is, whether or not this is uh, actual biological or a problem or, or a actual um, instrumental noise that we're seeing. So um, through that, yeah, this was a demonstration of that, that we could do this uh, cell by cell imaging and we're able to do this a lot faster now because we've changed the type of mass spectrometer we used. And we can do 200 cells uh, from three independent samples within a couple uh, hours because we're doing about two cells in a, a second, but we have to switch samples, of course. Um, so I'm running a little bit out of time here, but I do want to say that the thing that we've been working on and we're kind of stuck here for a little bit is that we added this second optic uh, here to do either another bright field, uh, another. Uh, well, in this case, we're trying to do um, fluorescence microscopy. So here's those soybean root nodule samples. And then we still have the um, sample set up, or the instrument set up to do bright field imaging, but we could actually do two fluorescence imaging um, lines if we wanted to. Of course, we have, the way we have it set up, we can, uh, if we didn't want to do a targeted analysis, we could do a spot by spot by spot by spot and create an image. So we can take our uh, leaf tissue in this case, uh, Lacey works really well for leaf tissues and just excise it, mount it on a slide and then do uh, um, Lacey analysis from spot to spot to spot to spot and then create a mass spec image of that. And that's sort of the result that we got from that. Um, and with that, uh, that's sort of the capabilities that we have at EMSL and what we've been developing uh, for spatial metabolomics. And I just want to point out, yeah, again, mass spec imaging uh, methods uh, permit us to perform spatial metabolomics down to the single cell resolution. We are still experimenting um, with the LACI to get it down uh, below 30 microns. Uh, the MALDI capability we have right now is about uh, 15 to 20, uh, five microns, depending on the types of molecules we're measuring um, and, and a couple other uh, factors. Uh, we're hoping to get that down within the next uh, year down uh, below 10. Um, so that gives you a little bit idea of what's possible. But again, uh, MALDI MSI was able to reveal the distribution of a variety of small molecules, and we could correlate them with the tissue uh, soybean root nodule functional units. So this idea, instead of just uh, a single cell, what the, also the, the cells that might be around each other and how they're acting uh, um, in concert with one another. Um, yeah, and then I'll show you some uh, the benefits of doing molecular tomography. And uh, now we have new on tissue derivatization methods that permits us to detect more small molecules while providing uh, high confidence in their identity. Um, and then we were able to use uh, uh, the LACI-based molecular microscope to target and obtain single cell metabolomic data. Um, again, we're trying to reduce the, the spot size that we can do, uh, but we recently rebuilt this so we could do everything on the 21T uh, we had to rebuild the cart uh, to do all this work on the 21 Tesla so we can get the isotope fine structure data as well. And if you're interested in becoming an EMSL user, uh, you, at any point, feel free to scan this QR code that's been up. Um, you can talk to Dushan and I about the different uh, 
mass-spec imaging capabilities, some of the optical microscopy capabilities we have. Amir, who's also a PCA um, uh, committee member, um, is uh, one of the people that leads the, the science focus of uh, uh, an EMSL on the plants, on the rhizosphere function specifically. Uh, he can help you with making sure your science uh, fits within with the BER scope. You know, these kind of questions that will score well with uh, EMSL user um, um, reviewers because it is a double blind um, um, user proposal um, process. Okay, and with that, I'd like to thank you all. Great, thank you so much, Chris. Um, do you prefer Chris or Christopher? Oh, uh, Chris is fine. Okay, just wanna make sure. Um, great, there's already a ton of questions popping up in the chat, so I'll launch right in. The first one is from Daquan Co. Um, and it says, thank you for introducing those great tools. I have a question regarding the distribution of phytohormones in roots. Is there any limit to measuring the distribution? Uh, for example, can any phytohormone be checked? Um, any plant species, including Arabidopsis? It's a great question. Sure. So is there a limit to measuring the distribution? Um, yeah, like I had noted, probably the lateral resolution uh, between 15 to 25 microns would be, uh, that would be the limit. Again, I would have to figure out what the um, quantitation is, but it's probably given, I don't know if this matters, but you know, one of the key limit to um, to measure any of these things is how sensitive is your assay, right? And I think we need to be in the femtomole region. So we could do the math and kind of figure out if it's something that you could measure. Um, can any phytohormones be checked? Uh, I'll have to get back on you. There's, uh, I, I gotta remember there's, especially with the derivatization method, there, it, it's made to, um, uh, modify major functional groups on almost all phytohormones have, and I'll, I'll have to get back to you on which those, uh, which ones those are. Um, and yeah, it should be agnostic to the plant species. Um, we've done some Arabidopsis work uh, before. We're doing a lot of sorghum at the moment. Um, but again, this is really dependent on uh, the EMSL user uh, base and what they're um, interested in, or there's other opportunities to work with us outside the EMSL user um, uh, program like we can apply for uh, usually DOE grants, uh, external DOE grants and work together. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Um, the next question is from Dave Jackson. Uh, wonderful talk. How do you derivatize specific hormones for analysis? Um, can you diver derivatize specific sugars? Um, we, I have some of the sugars, yes, we can. And some of them, um, I'm actually seeing if Dushin is on on this uh, teams, but he can, um, can, can we come back to David in a second? I'll see if Dushin's on teams real quick and then he can answer that one. For, yeah, definitely. That one. Do you want to move to the next one? And then- uh, Yeah, please, we'll come right back okay. to David. Yeah, these, these questions are excellent. They're all questions that- I was thinking about as well. So the, the next question is uh, from Camila Medina. Um, she also says, great talk. Um, and have you thought about carrying out this type of simulating products for metabolism, such as latissifers or idioblasts? So I guess like latex mm. producing um, cells. Could be one yeah. Example. So I know we haven't thought about carrying out this study. I mean, I think that that's the benefit about the, the user facility is uh, hearing your ideas and seeing. I, I think one of the, you know, I think to give you some, uh, a different answer, I think the answer uh, would be to give you a different answer. Um, I haven't thought about it. One of the things we always have to think about is how we get the samples uh, into, um, to prepare and handle the samples, et cetera, uh, to actually do these kind of measurements, which can be the real challenge. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, sorry, I don't, I, we haven't thought about it, but yeah, that's a good idea. Um, I know that there's a more, I think there's more interest in the DOE on, especially on some of those, uh, latex ones. So yeah, that and was... doing those bio, bio products. So yeah, that has been brought up and we've worked with some folks on, on that. So 
not maybe those necessary cell types, those ideas of bioproducts, et cetera. Yeah, well, okay. Camille is an expert. Um, that would be a really cool study. Um, yeah. uh, the next question is from Maria Harrison. Uh, very mm -hmm. exciting technology. Um, and thanks for the successful talk. I agree, very accessible for us non-chemists. Um, with the microscopy and LACI, can it be used for cells below the surface of the tissue? And if so, how deep can you go? Sure, and I didn't put the slide in here, um, but uh, this, actually, let me share this real quick again. Um, yeah, I didn't put the slide in here, uh, but this, um, this uh, scheme basically was an idea that we, uh, we had because we were able to do depth profiling of entire nodules where we just shoot the laser, collect the mass spec, shoot the laser. A again, it depends on the tissue type. Um, you know, I think within the nodules, uh, we got down to, we think based upon focusing, we have, I mean, this is a pretty good um, estimate of that between um, 150 to 250 microns because we know from the data that uh, once we would, you know, you can see the soya saponins on, um, on the epidermis of the tissue and um, and those early mass spec data. And as we went through the sample, we start to see the soya saponin signal dissipate. We saw more heme B, we saw more organic acids, some other things like that. Uh, so that's in this plant cell. Um, uh, but let's see, can I not? Yeah, that's in this, uh, not plant cell, but plant J paper, if cool. someone's interested. Very cool. Um, there's one more question, and then we could try to circle back to Dave's. Yep. Um, and this is an anonymous question. Amazing to see these developments. If you can detect specific isotopes, could one analyze, analyze metabolic fluxes with uh, carbon labeling or similar? Are you trying anything in this direction? So I guess more dynamic. Yeah. Yeah, so there was a uh, a paper um, with um, oh my gosh, uh, Lauren Meredith and uh, Malak Tlafi at University of Arizona that we just uh, worked on, where they were looking at uh, these different flowering plants, and we did isotopic analysis where we used uh, the NanoSims instrument, which is very good for looking at uh, isotopic uh, enrichment because that's sort of what it's designed for. It's not looking for molecules, but isotopic and rich um, And then we try to match it back with the moldy. We think from some other data that we have, it, th this is kind of a really complex um, analytical challenge, but we think you need about 5%, at least 5% enrichment in order to actually be able to measure a change um, in the uh, isotopic distribution with uh, within a molecule. I mean, it's something that we're actively going to, uh, we're actively thinking about and trying. We've tried it with some other techniques as well. And that really is just a, a function of confidence in that, like, if you saw this peak pop up, this N plus one peak up pop up, you would need some amount of confidence that you actually know that that was like an N15 that jumped versus the C13 um, peak. So that's why we think we need about 5% um, enrichment into a molecule before we actually were able to confidently say something was there. With the nanosims you could do, if you just wanna look at where isotopic enrichment is within a cell, you could do like uh, in the parts per billion. So you don't need much to get there. But again, you won't have molecular information. You just know where the isotope ended up. Yeah. Okay, David, sorry. I did not have an answer to you, but I can send you. So can you do a derivative specific sugars? I think the answer is yes, because it's different aldehydes and uh, carboxylic acid groups that this um, uh, molecule derivatizes. So it should show up, absolutely. And uh, I would have to just, I could stop and re look at the paper again and all the things that we've been doing, uh, but I'd, I wanna be very precise. So uh, and I don't, yeah, I can just email you offline or I can, if you leave this question uh, live, I'll, I'll type in my answer if that's okay. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. I think you're going to get a bunch of community proposals now. So, uh, or user yeah. proposals. Uh, yeah. yeah, really amazing technology. Thanks so much. Sure. Cool.